So, very good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Katya Oisherman. I am the new director of the uh, Temple Museum of Jewish Art, Religion, and Culture. And uh, I only recently, from last September, uh, overtook this position from the extraordinary Sukoletsky, who is just over there. The recent recipient of the Cleveland Art Prize for making that museum what it is. And we are really tremendously privileged to, uh, uh, to have that museum and enjoy the uh, fruit of labor. And, uh, really the almost a lifetime that's so dedicated to that uh, wonderful institution. So uh, today we're here on a slightly unusual sort of turn of events for the museum because normally we uh, do not really deal with astronomy, celestial phenomena, and things like this. Uh, but given that uh, tomorrow, 2 p.m., if I'm not mistaken? Tomorrow. What, About what 26 time? 26 hours or so. Yeah. 27? 3.15. Okay, so... 3.15 is the peak. 3.13. Okay, so tomorrow, f <laughs> so so tomorrow, three uh, fifteen, without our uh, sort of any kind of initiative on our part, uh, it was decided, not here, that there's going to be an incredible celestial spectacle that we call the eclipse. Uh, given that that's the situation we're in. Uh, in the museum here, we sort of talked this through with Sue, and we decided that we should do something about that. Given, again, that the whole city of Cleveland is going completely crazy. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so we, de we decided to join the, the Carnivale, and Sue had an idea. She had, well, I, I have friends. And these friends are par appear to be the real eclipse chasers, and they even have an extraordinary collection of stuff that they've covered throughout their, their journeys. And this is how the idea sort of came about, and after we had a, a, a lively exchange via email and, and Zoom with, uh, uh, with um, Clint and Donald, they just um, sent me a couple of boxes, fairly voluminous ones, <laughs> and there was this treasure. There was this absolutely incredible treasure there that consisted of t-shirts and newspapers and magazines and artworks and all sorts of things that I cannot really even describe sort of give them a category. It's, it, it, it was this really, really extraordinary box. Um, and uh, uh, I had this lovely time just trying to figure out how to make this into, uh, into an exhibit. And it was much easier than it, it, it was actually, this collection is really very easily sort of gave itself to the, uh, to, to the suggestion that it should be exhibited. Um, so here we are with um, the Eclipse Collection, 30 years of chase in totality. And it is my great pleasure to uh, present to your attention our speakers today. And from what I understand, probably most of you know them much better than I do. <laughs> but still, since we went through all the uh, proper procedures with choreographies and sort of exhibition panels and we, we did everything sort of as we were supposed to. So let me just introduce uh, our distinguished speakers and guests. So Clint Werner grew up in North Carolina where he saw his first eclipse, a lunar, at eight years of age. He earned a degree with a double major in journalism and theater and experienced his first solar eclipse while attending grad school in North Carolina. A 99.8% annular, just 0.2% from total. You will have to explain what it means, I think. 
Clint's interest in the cosmic and numinous was enhanced by his experience of hundreds of Grateful Dead shows and his microbiotic studies in Boston. And Donald Abrams was born in New York and raised in Cleveland Heights and University Heights. He is an oncologist who was a pioneer in the AIDS crisis. Dr. Abrams conducted some of the first trials demonstrating the health benefits to cannabis. He is the immediate past chief of hematology oncology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. He retired in 2020, but is still doing integrative oncology consultations as a professor emeritus of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, Osher Center for Integrative Health. So, how did you have the time for all of that? And 30 <laughs> years of chasing the eclipse, isn't that absolutely extraordinary? So, uh, just uh, to say that Lately, the world is really a green place. And it's funny that while the eclipses have often historically been per perceived as those kind of very um, threatening omens or you know, bad things to come, it's really extraordinary that in this time, the eclipse is really one of the funniest, sort of easiest, uh, just spectacular things that we can simply enjoy without necessarily giving it this kind of difficult, dreadful meanings because this is already supplied. So maybe Kadosh Baruchu provides us with a little break so that we can just look at the sky and see really that the world is much bigger than us. So uh, the only last thing that I do want to uh, uh, to say uh, in my capacity as the director, I just want to remind you that uh, in the Hard Square Gallery, uh, we're almost finished with the installation of From Israel Now, and hopefully in a couple of weeks the exhibition will be completely up and running. So it is an exhibit that is dedicated to the events of October 7th, uh, and ways in which artists from Israel currently reflect on, uh, on those events and uh, the aftermath of October 7th. It's, it's a very, very different uh, uh, exhibit altogether and uh, there will be uh, artist talks and uh, group visits that we will, I, I will let uh, the temple congregation, of course, know. Uh, so just keep that in mind that it's, it's there as well. So other than that and without further ado, great. Good. Donald, the mic is yours. Thank you, Katya, and you, thank you, Katya yeah. and Sue, for making this all possible. So I am Donald, and uh, I, at age 10, was president of my junior congregation at Temple Beth Shalom. The plan was that I would become a rabbi, but my temple folded after my bar mitzvah. I always say making me a man was a hard act to follow. So instead of becoming a rabbi, I became an oncologist, which in a way is a little bit similar in some fashion. Anyway, and uh, I loved our yin and yang uh, introductions that Katya read. They sort of oncology versus deadhead. Uh, that's who we are. We're very yin and yang, and this is our 30th uh, year of chasing eclipses together. So Clint will tell us how he got into eclipses. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. And uh, so before I start, I just want to give a salute to a dear, dear old friend and uh, mentor of mine, who would be very proud if he could see me today, uh, Morris Rubin Kessner, who was my sort of um, interfaith rabbi. He was the first person to ever say I was a minch. Mm -hmm. And uh, I helped him a little bit, and he helped me a lot. And um, I just wanted to say thanks, rabbi, because mm -hmm. um, he meant a lot to, we meant a lot to each other. Um, so I got into eclipses. First, my dad was so cool. We lived in North Carolina, and there was a lunar eclipse when I was about eight, and he woke me up and took me out and showed it to me, and so that was the first thing that ever happened, and then there wasn't a lot in my consciousness. I was going about life, growing up, went to college, um, but in college, um, I got interested in lunar eclipses because there was one when I was there that was really beautiful and just lyrically the way it unfolded and everything just enchanted me. 
And then a couple of years later, there was an opportunity to see this annular eclipse of the sun in North Carolina, which was 99.8% total or full. Now, if it had been 0.2% more, it would have been a total eclipse. But as it was, it was just, there was just a thinnest line around the black disc and you still had to use your glasses. So I had welder's glass and I used it and I was predisposed to think you always had to use glass or glasses when you looked at a total eclipse. So I was kind of a lunar eclipse chaser until I met a real solar eclipse chaser. He said, you're nuts. You have no idea. You've got to start seeing solar eclipse. I'm like, you always have to wear, he's like, no, no, no. During the peak period, you've got, you know, you take them off and it's the most amazing thing you'll ever witness. Lunar eclipses are pretty, but these are transformational. So I planned and I went to Hawaii in 91 for the great uh, eclipse there and uh, stayed at a place where they had a nice program and my friend wanted me to stay there and I wanted to go someplace else and it was cloudy where we stayed and clear where I wanted to go so generally I go with my gut now and not other people or uh, sort of cerebral ideas um, but that was uh, launched me because I was really hungry to see totality after that so 1994 uh, let me just paint the picture a little bit. So I was an AIDS oncologist. And those of you that remember AIDS, uh, it was a time before we had any effective treatment. And in fact, the four men that I lived with or shared my life with from age 25 to 39 were all dead. And so it was still a bleak time in this epidemic. And I met Clint. And I was a famous young AIDS doctor. In fact, I have a walk-in role in uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, if you've seen that movie. And uh, I had a lot of miles from traveling all over the world, being an AIDS expert and lecturing, and I told Clint how many airline miles I had when we first met. Uh, let's just say, I was a real catch back then. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to impress me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and he so, did. <laughs> so he said, well, how would you like to see a total solar eclipse in the Atacama Desert of Chile? And I said, okay, let's go. So we did, and I really had no idea what this, this was going to be like. And we get to the Chile, and we saw penguins in front of our hotel, and then we take this bus 14,000 feet up or something to the Atacama Desert. There's landscape where they've never seen rain. It was a very Judean experience, or vista. And then the moon started to touch the sun, and that was the beginning, that's first contact. We'll talk about eclipses a little bit later. And then I sat there and I watched, and as Clint said, totality is the thing. The partial phases are nothing compared to totality, and when the, the moon finally covers the sun, what you see is the black side of the moon and the sun's energy radiating off the back side of the moon. And for me, it was like looking into the eye of God. It was, as far as I could tell, nature's greatest spectacle. Uh, I, that's why we continue to chase them. And it was such a powerful experience. I laughed, I cried, I jumped, we kissed. It was, you know, it was, you know, life changing. And the last thing that happens before you have to put your glasses back on is the so-called final diamond ring. And the first one I saw. I thought the freaking sun was exploding, and I thought it, I really did think it was the end of the world, which many people equate with total solar eclipses. And you spoke to other people that thought they had seen a total before. Yeah, well, we were up there, and we were both sort of novices to what was going to happen, and naive and hopeful, and kind of know, but you don't know until you experience it. And so there was this guide who was, you know, a Chilean guy who was our guy, and he was cool, but. He had a little swagger, you know, and someone says, have you ever seen a total eclipse of the sun before? He goes, yeah, yeah, man, I've seen a total solar eclipse. Yeah, yeah, I saw one. And so, you know, cool. After totality, after the spectacle had revealed itself and then receded into normality, um, normalcy, uh, at that point, I'd see him, and he's going staggering by, literally <laughs> staggering by, holding his head in his hands going, oh, my God. 
Oh my God, I never saw nothing like that. I never saw nothing like that. I thought the mothership was coming down. <laughs> so I just know that if you ask someone, have you ever seen a total eclipse of the sun? And they go, well, yeah. I'm like, no, you haven't. You just you have not. <laughs> it's before and after. Thailand. And so uh, after Donald and I went to Chile, uh, Right before that, our bond had really tightened and I had moved in with him and we knew, because I don't know, we just knew, we both had sort of this, um, we shared, you know, the shared grief of the times we were in, but we also had a certain sort of spontaneous, little irreverent attitude towards things. <laughs> and so I knew he was the one. And so I moved in and we started a full on partnership relationship. And then we decided we got to do this again. What's the next one? Thailand, Thailand, yeah, I want to go to Thailand. So we bought, you know, the tickets and reserved the hotel in Bangkok. And in Thailand, you have to be very sweet and not angry. So we reserved for the day of the eclipse. The path was north of Thailand. So we had a driver who was supposed to pick us up very early and drive us up to the path. And he was late and he was late. And we were like, ah. So he came and he got us and he drove us and he got us there by driving on the side of the road. And I'm like, with my map, I'm like, okay, we're into the path. If we can go a little more, we get more time. So we pulled off at this cantina type, you know, Thai, what I call a cantina little. And they had a spirit house that they have there. And I'm into mysticism. You know, I'm not an atheist. I'm not a sky god man person. But I really believe there is more to life and that there is this pattern excreting consciousness that's transcendent. And this is part of the patterns and that we are given on this beautiful earth. So my friend Rick Doblin, our friend, gave me a little candle to take and light at totality to clear the clouds or just to pray with. And um, there were big puffy white clouds and we were like, ugh. And we met this cool guy, Rick Brown, who's a hardcore eclipse chaser. But I took it and I asked a local and he said, sure. And I put it in the spirit house, lit it and prayed. And I turned around, the clouds were gone gone not a sign and so we were there and totality was on you know watching it and we were on the side of a highway and way down all along the highway in the median were these lights you know the highway lights and we could see as the shadow was moving towards us from down the highway the lights were coming on and it was really trippy and then beautiful totality just Thai people were so into it and so gracious and kind and joyous. And so we said, when's the next one? Yeah. So we were a little, you're, you're not really supposed to get angry in Thailand. You have to be. And when the driver was an hour late and we knew that we had to get X number of miles up the road to get to the eclipse, we got into this huge traffic jam. And that's why he drove on the side of the road to get us there because <laughs> we were a little bit angry. And we told him we came all the way from San Francisco to Bangkok to see this and we don't want to miss it. 98% was not going to cut yeah, it. Yeah, and then the problem was I had to go pee and so that's why we pulled off the road and then there was no way to get back on it because it was just solid traffic not moving so that's where we saw Thailand. And then the next one was Mongolia and we flew to Ulaanbaatar in the winter and uh, we got on a train from Ulaanbaatar to go to Darkhan, which is uh, even more remote. <laughs> and it was snowing, uh, completely white. The ground was white, the sky was white, and the air was white from huge snowflakes like I've never seen. And the Mongolian people are really very elegant in their fur hats and fur coats. And we were a bunch of astronomy people and, and eclipse chasers. And they had set up a gurt uh, up on this hill. And in Mongolia, they, there are a lot of shaman, and they have these things. I think they're called uvus. They're piles of rocks and skulls, and you sort of worship that or, or pay heed to it. And we're all sitting in the gurt, and totality is going to happen. And we had that candle that Rick Doblin gave us. And it was a, I had lit that candle, but because of that, I had gone into the hate ashbury and got another cute oh, little I psychedelic. Same one. Anyway, so same we, principle. We put the candle in the sun, and there was Clint, who's not Jewish, and me, who's Jewish, and we had a Hindu and a Muslim, and we all went out and held hands in the snow, 
and lit the candle, but it went out very quickly from the snow. So we all ran back into the girt because it was freezing. Clint Alexander Werner, C-A-W, Caw, his father told him he was brought by crows. And we have crows that follow us in San Francisco when we walk our dogs because Clint calls and, and feeds them. And so they follow us and they crap all over our back. They bring anyway, presents. Anyway, they bring presents. But suddenly I'm in the girt and Clint wasn't there and I hear, call, call. I said, oh, I know that crow. And so I, I walk out and Clint's standing there in the snow going, call, call. And he said, a crow came by and told him what he needed to do. Call, call. And then there's a village of Mongolians up on the hill and they're all call, call, <laughs> playing drums and the clouds parted. The clouds parted for totality and then totality ended and the clouds got covered and a, a murder of crows flew across the, the sky. And when we got back to the hotel, we were the only people in Mongolia who saw totality because of Clint. Well, like, not me. Oh, I, yeah, tell I, them about what this astronomer's son who was with us, who was about 17, looks at me and goes, man, thanks for making it so we could see the eclipse. And I said, I didn't do it. I just asked real hard. <laughs> but no, I, I, I was, we lit, you know, it was, there was no sun. There was, it was just white uniform. And we had the candle and we all held hands. It was multi, um, you know, in, interfaith. <laughs> And everybody, you know, from the main ones, Hindu, Christian background, Jewish, Muslim, and we're all, and so a big snowflake, I lit it, we held hands, meditated, big snowflake puts it out, I've been down, and they run off, and I'm like, no, no, you have to believe. So I'm trying to light the candle, and a crow, my buddy lands right there, and he just looks at me, he goes, if you do the crow ritual, you're gonna see the eclipse. And I'm like, I'm all in, what have I got to lose? And so I started doing sort of a, mystic crow ritual <laughs> dance and the people behind me uh, they're mongolians they're shamanic they're mystical they start caw, 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 and banging metal drums and pots and and i'm like and i'm like unveiling like the curtains <laughs> parting and we see the black disc and we didn't get a perfect clear sky view but it was black and the corona was like looping up off it into the why? Oh, it was beautiful. And the astronomers all went out and undid their cameras so that they could take, and people said, we don't know what you're doing. Well, that one guy yells, I don't know what you're doing, but for God's sake, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so, and before this, actually, there was a gap between 95 and 97, and we were on an RSVP cruise um, it was a non-eclipse year, and 96... And Tell them what RSVP is. RSVP is a gay and lesbian cruise. It was really... Things weren't as progressed as they have been now. It was still a lot of um, tough times for, you know, us. We were... But it gave us a safe space, especially people who didn't live in San Francisco and um, came from small communities where they were closeted and they could just be themselves on these ships and these cruises. And so at the end, of, we were on one, and at the end of the cruise, they have a thing where you meet the president and then you sign up for next year's cruises. And I took my little NASA Eclipse book, and we go in and we sit down. And say, we're not signing up for a cruise next year, but we think you ought to do the first gay and lesbian total solar eclipse cruise. And I hand him and show the map going through the Caribbean in February, and he looks at us, he looks at, and he takes it and photocopies it. He says, okay, thank you very much. Well, we got a call from him a few months later. He's like, we're doing it, we're doing it. I'm sending you the itinerary. We're going to be in Aruba. We're doing this. And so he sent out the flyer with, you know, the total solar eclipse cruise. Fastest sellout they ever had, like a day and a half. It was <laughs> sold. And we did it, and it was beautiful. Everything was wonderful. And um, I just love making this happen for people, you know, when I get a chance to... Uh, there are many of us who are Eclipse evangelists because we try and recruit people to do this. And so that was just for me a huge win, getting a couple of hundred people to see something like this. The ship ultimately uh, sank, but it wasn't while well, we were on it. <laughs> it wasn't because of that either, but it did. It did, you know, I think they did it on purpose because it was old. But scuttled it. We had a whole floor, and we had 20 friends, 
uh, they used to be the observation deck or something, and we got all the rooms. We we had a free ride, I believe, and yeah. then our friends were we were all together. So that also um, the next eclipse uh, after Mongolia was in '99, 1999, and. That sort of gave me the idea that we got a free pass on that one, right? Because it can get expensive. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, if I, and there was this wonderful guy who we had met who was an eclipse trip planner, and I talked to him, and he put together a trip um, to Hungary and the Czech Republic because they have a lot of mysticism, and I'm interested in a lot of the um, mysticism associated with that. And so he put that together, and I got a bunch of people together and it paid for our trips to go there, but Hungary eclipse, August 11th, 1999 is my very favorite eclipse so far ever because we were going to this little peninsula um, on the Lake Balaton and, I, and it's where the center line was, but it was so cheesy. It was like Coney Island minus. It was just, it was like, I don't want to be here for eclipse, the eclipse. <laughs> so on the way up, I had noticed this hill with something on it, and I, on the way back, I asked our guide, can we go and look at this? And it was a hill with the ruins of a 13th century castle stretched across it, um, overlooking Lake Balaton on one side, and then hay fields flat out on the other side, um, with little hills, silo, mountains, hills silhouetted in the very distance. And that was exquisitely perfect for me. I had this group, it's rained cats and dogs the night before that morning, it was gone, beautiful clear sky, and we get up there, and it's just people from all over the world stretched out, you know, on their blankets and picnicking and sharing, and it was so exquisitely beautiful among um, those ruins, so atmospheric, like Merlin was going to pop in, and we saw the shadow rise on the horizon in the distance. Uh, a line of deep indigo powder blue appear and then rise up. We saw alternating bands of light and dark, the shadow bands, the beautiful diamond ring and total eclipse over Lake Balaton. And then after that, Donald's previous partner's sister who was with us and her husband, Pat and Bill, um, Bill knew that I'm a deadhead, and so he learned to play Ripple, the Grateful Dead song, on the harmonica. <laughs> and after totality, right there in the ruins, he played it for me. And, you know, what more? I'm mean, probably the greatest day of my life, I suppose. <laughs> you do like that one, I know. So 2002, uh, we went to Australia and took a flight over Antarctica because we weren't really keen on going to Antarctica to see totality. So <laughs> we flew over Antarctica and half the plane got to look out the window and see totality, the other half, I forget if they... Well, they didn't really, I mean, they, pay they less? Sell a few, right. sold a few or something. I don't remember because there was only one half that could see it. The thing that's interesting about this is, as I recall, it's the wide path because of the configuration of the yeah. pole. And, and so they found that they could take this jet and fly it at a certain point at an angle and it would move with the moon's shadow. So you got more time, and you could see it, the eclipse uh, totality right outside the window at this angle, but you get more time than you would get stationary on the ground. Um, so we've done three flights. We did, after that, uh, a few years later, we did the North Pole. And we uh, got a t-shirt that said, now I'm bipolar, because we did <laughs> Antarctica and the North Pole. And uh, then we did, uh, a flight over the Faroe Islands way, way up north uh, because we thought that the weather wasn't going to be nice on the ground and in the Faroe Islands it wasn't nice at all, but Clint likes or thinks airplane eclipses are okay. For me it's like watching on television because you're looking out that window and it's sort of framed and it's not the same as being on the land. But I, I do like cruises and uh, we uh, ultimately got married in 2004 for the first time married three times because those weddings got annulled. Or <laughs> so uh, in 2004, we also had a big party for 150 people, and we said, we don't need anything. But if you want to give us something, you can donate to our eclipse cruise. So we, in uh, 2005, 
That w was that our first cruise? Yeah. Yeah, we went on the Paul After Gauguin. After the RSVP, but it was our first Oh, yeah. 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 We went on the Paul Gauguin, which is a cruise ship in Tahiti. And we've done three eclipses on the Paul Gauguin, actually, but this one was our wedding, and they dressed us up and took pictures of us with Bora Bora behind us, and it was, it was a lovely eclipse. And the issue there is it was on April 8th. 2005, and it was a good one, and so tomorrow's April 8th. Well, the, I believe that that was actually the one, too, where it was it was good, but it was a little dodgy, because they were dodging some clouds, and like, the captain was like turning the ship and moving it, and when the eclipse started, if you were on the first half of the ship, as we were, you saw the first, on the front half, you saw the first diamond ring, but the people who were at the back missed the diamond ring, first diamond ring, because they were under cloud cover still, but then we were out and everyone saw everything. But it was a short one, too. It was like 50 seconds or something. Oh, the long one. Um, oh, we went on a cruise. Well, I held out because there was the longest duration that we could see from this point on, and that was... Um, it went through China, and a lot of people signed up to go to China, but the longest point was out at sea... Um, near Iwo Jima, right? Yeah, it was Iwo Jima near there. And it was like six minutes and 39 seconds, I believe, of totality. And that's a long time. And I was just like, so I held out and held out. I didn't want to go to China and get four minutes or whatever. You know, I mean, four minutes is a lot, but not for that one. It was our last chance. And so finally, someone put a cruise out and we went on the cruise and it was right there at the maximum point. Skies like this crystal clear blue skies. Mm -hmm. Pat um, came with us, yeah. Bill, who had done that. She's become an eclipse chaser, mm -hmm. his stepsister, or in-law, whatever. <laughs> and um, it was just, that was a great time. So actually, my favorite, one of my favorite eclipses was Turkey. Uh, and uh, my sister Ellen, in the audience here, was with us on that trip. It was, we had Andy Weil, and Paul Stamets, the mycologist, and Andy's astrologer, Caroline Casey, and David Grinspoon, whose father is Peter Grinspoon, and they, uh, Lester Grinspoon, Lester Grinspoon, a, a famous cannabis expert, and I, as mentioned, I'm a cannabis uh, scientist. So, so th that was beautiful. I mean, being in in Turkey, the the ruins. I I had spent a, a a summer in Greece, and no offense to my dear friend Babas, who's also here. But Turkish ruins are amazing. They're like a whole city. The Greek ruins, the Acropolis, they're, panth they're all very cool, but they're not as extensive. Or maybe I haven't seen the right places. Babas will correct me if I'm wrong, as he usually does. Anyway, but uh, 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 Turkey was fabulous. And let me just say, eclipses travel in 18-year cycles, which is interesting because 18 the Ivrit is Chai, which is life. So these are called Sero cycles. And every 18 years, the eclipse path is the same shape, but it moves one third over and one third up or down the globe. And it's 18 years and 11 days and six hours difference. So that eclipse in Turkey was in 2006, March 29th. In fact, Clint designed t-shirt and he said how does this look and it, it said I wanted to do it the American way right the the way we do our calendars and our dates yeah he did it said eclipse turkey march 20 March 20 and, and it sounded like I said a turkey march sounds like you know some kind of a dance or something I don't know. so we did 29 March 2000 but the point is that the eclipse tomorrow is in the same sorrows as that eclipse in Turkey. And so it, it was, was my great. fave and it was beautiful. We all saw it on the beach. and The Mediterranean there, yeah. It was, it was outstanding. So we're hoping tomorrow will be a reproduction of <laughs> Turkey. And you t the well, charm you It was a beautiful um, experience I had because I take, I'd like to order and get a lot of eclipse shades and give them out when people don't have them and when we're in regions, um, it just lifts people up so much, and it's, you know, what does it cost? 25 cents, 50 cents if you buy them in bulk. 
And um, so I had a bunch that I had taken with us to Turkey. And so we get to, I believe it was Ephesus, where there's just these roads that go through these ruins. And they're, you know, beautiful. And it was a beautiful day. And we're there. And I brought all these glasses. And there are all these um, women sitting along the path with their blankets spread out. And they're selling charms. I love the evil eye, the blue with the um, white and black dot. Um, and they're all spread out there. And so everyone I went by, I gave them, you know, a pair of glasses or a couple. You have kids or whatever that we could, you know, we could communicate and not so much by language. And so I'm just giving them all and I, on the way in and I'm giving them out. So I'm, and I'm taking in all these ruins and drinking in all the beauty and wonder and mystery and majesty of it all. And so then it's time to leave and we're leaving and we're walking back. And they all started running up to me and pressing, um, evil eye charms into my hand and looking in my eye and holding my hand and like clasping it with gratitude and thanking me and it was just it was beautiful you know one of those moments that's beyond identity and role playing and politics and crap pardon me but um you know it was just it was a beautiful thing another and great cruise that we did we've done a lot of eclipse cruises was from Darwin, Australia to Borneo, all through Indonesia. And the best snorkeling I've ever done is in Indonesia. And uh, we got to uh, one place where uh, it was, uh, we walked into a building and it was like an eclipse fair. And there were all these uh, students in Indonesia, Islamic, of course, uh, the women were all dressed in these outfits. Jobs. And somehow we got to talking and they found out that we were eclipse chasers so they took us and sat us in a booth and we were surrounded by all these uh, Islamic students who wanted to interview us about our eclipse experiences and we have great pictures of us and surrounded by this group of people that were really uh, you know, very they were crackling with enthusiasm they were yeah. so excited it was they really great the thumbs up last American well, um, then for so long, you know, I had wanted to see an eclipse here in the United States. I would be always going here, there, and I'm like, gosh, wouldn't it be great to just have one here? Mm -hmm. And so I kept looking forward to 2017, and mm. the path was nice because it Oregon down to mm. South Carolina, and I got a lot of friends up in Oregon, people who are dog people with me. We have dachshunds together and um, share dogs and everything and so I had friends up there and then hippie friends from the deadhead world and so we got referred to friends of friends who had a cabin uh, with doc they raised dachshunds and they're out in the woods and um, eastern Oregon sort of uh, eastern part of Oregon John Day and so we got an RV and we went up there and so many of my friends, it was so great. Um, John and Terry, who were here, I believe, and um, just all kinds of friends came up and met, met us. People I had done Grateful Dead tour with, and then friends I had in general, and then a friend or so from the cannabis research realm. And it was a perfectly blue sky, exquisite day. We had a couple of our dogs with us, and uh, was just everything beautiful that could be and the neat thing was I had told some people about about it and sent them classes who lived in the path and they you know they were completely blown away by what her. they were very grateful I told them to be home and uh, watch the event then we had a little break during the lockdown uh, we had booked an eclipse uh, trip to I think Argentina where we were supposed to go? Yeah, we were going to Argentina. And then uh, they canceled it because of COVID. So we had a little dry spell, and then... then yeah. Well, so we were going to go to Argentina. Um, that was canceled. And then there was another Antarctic eclipse, Antarctica. And um, I think we had both pretty much written that one off. That would be the first one we would purposely miss. Because I'm not doing a two-week cruise... <laughs> To be cold and miss an eclipse in the clouds. That's why we flew. One of the reasons we flew on that one because you're above the clouds. 
And in Antarctica, it's pretty sketchy. And for that one, there was a land-based group. The people we know who cruised, they got clouded out. There was a land-based group that got like 30 seconds of totality where they were. And um, good for them. Um, but I don't like cold that much. So we weren't going to do that one. And then it was still the COVID thing we were planning for the next one was Australia. And um, we're 20. Yeah, it was 420, if any of you know what that means in a certain countercultural reference. Um, you know, for a deadhead, it's like a <laughs> holiday. Uh, but so that was on 420, the eclipse in Australia, and we weren't going to go because they had 10 day quarantine if you tested positive. And I'm like, I'm not going all the way, miss the eclipse in quarantine, and then come home. But they dropped that, and so all of a sudden I said, let's go. He said, okay, good. I'm like, yes. And so we went and we got on a cruise that was just dedicated for the eclipse that went out of Perth up into the eclipse path and then back. And so it was all eclipse nuts and people and it was so beautiful and wonderful. And it was only one minute of totality, but it was a perfectly clear sky. And after I had a medical issue that came up during COVID, not COVID, but um, it was a, been a challenge, and then COVID and everything, just so much, you know. And so seeing that, it just was such a transcendent, reaffirming, uplifting moment. I was weeping, and I needed it, and we needed it, mm -hmm. and it was one of the very best days in my life. Mm -hmm. right on. Oh. Yep. Tell, them, tell, them what it's, I, tell them what happens during an eclipse, though. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I want to is talk about, for me, some of the attraction to a total solar eclipse comes from my interest in mysticism. And there's a lot of schools of mysticism, but one that has been, um, even though before I married into the faith, um, I was very interested in the um, Kabbalistic um, studies and mysticism and the symbolism yeah. and what it means and sort of interested in the teachings of Isaac Luria and um, the whole expression of the understanding of the natural world through this lens. And what it says to me, this phenomenon of the total solar eclipse is, I, and I'm, if I'm wrong, y'all tell me, but the Ein Sof is like the light of creation, the light of life. And that's what we look at during totality is the light of all creation. It will burn your eyes out if you try and look at it any other time directly. But you can see it obliquely emanating with its pearly, luminescent brilliance behind this black disk. And so to me, it really does represent the light of life. And it is the light of creation. It has brought and summoned everything into physicality in our world. Um, you know, no light, no life. And so just gazing at that, it, it elevates me. It, it's like an um, altered state of consciousness when I get to stare at that. And so that is part, and, and we've heard astronomers on like, isn't it an amazing coincidence that there's just the right distance and size between the sun and the moon's at just the right distance and the right size to perfectly block it out? And it's a coincidence. And then you have the ultra-religious people say, no, it's God's will. It's a symbol of the whatever they're saying now. <laughs> and I'm like, you're both wrong, okay? I mean, you don't know. You don't know. I don't really know, I believe. But to me, there's a cosmic intentionality. There's something beyond our ability to grok and put, you know, represent and put a handle on something mysterious but it loves us and it wants us to exist and have awe and wonder and reflect it back to the, to the source. And so, you know, that's how I feel about that. And um, well, I just, you just said awe. I read a book called Awe and the guy never mentioned a total eclipse. But I that. sent him a message and he, he told me he had seen a couple. he's quoted in all these <laughs> magazine articles about how awesome eclipses are. I was disappointed. But tell people about what, what to expect then. Okay, so how, let's just say, oh, how yeah. many people have ever seen a total solar eclipse? Cool, good number. Um, so you know what's gonna, so for me, we're out there, right? 
We know it's going to happen. We know the time of first contact. When you got the sun, you're looking through your glasses. And then I don't believe it's going to happen. I mean, I believe, I know, but part of me is like doubting Thomas or whatever. It's like, <laughs> is this really going to happen? And then when I see that first incursion on the sun's circumference, that first irregularity, and then it becomes a little nibble and a bite. And I'm like, yes, it's really happening. We're here at the right time in the right place. And then that just grows. And should I just give my advice at that point? I mean, yeah, it's not no. too earthy. So I just tell people, when you first see that bite and you've seen it, and you're, go to the bathroom. Go then get it out of the way because it's very exciting and you don't want to be um, excited and uncomfortable. And the thing that really makes me, I did hear a story. You will, he hates it when I talk about bodily functions. Well, especially at dinner. Anyway, well, right? well I, I, there was a story that I, apparently is true. There was a man who took a group of people to see a total solar eclipse tour leader on a boat, and he had to go to use the bathroom before too close to totality, you know, five, ten minutes. And he went down, and he got lost in the labyrinth of the boats, you know, and he couldn't get up and he missed totality. He could hear people screaming. So I just say go take care of business right after you see it started because nothing much interesting really happens except that bite gets bigger for about 30 or 40 minutes. Then as it gets to be a crescent and you're looking through your glasses, you can look underneath trees or where there's holes projected um, there are not, not many leaves now, but usually where the dappling light is under leaves. Or you can do this and like make holes between, you know, pinholes between your fingers. Crescents, they turn into crescents. You might have seen this at the partial eclipse last October if, it, if you had a crescents here from that. But just these, they, they're like fish scales all over the ground and they're just very bizarre looking. And so. You've got that going on. And then about 20, 30 minutes before the full impact, totality, things get weird. Things just start to get progressively weird. And I, the light changes, the way the um, color of the leaves looks, it gets different. Um, your surroundings change. The color of the sky is starting to change some. Um, temperature gets cooler, the of course the intensity of the sun, you lose that, and it, it's just very bizarre. As it progresses, like buildings in the distance look like hyper-realistic, almost like toy models or something because they're so defined. Your shadow, when you look at your shadow, you can see every hair on your head distinct. Um, and then it just progresses. So here's what I'll walk you through to try and remember. You're there, you're watching it. The crescent shrinking down. At some point, the crescent really shrinks to like a line that's reached around a, a filament of light that's curved around the top of the encroaching black moon. And so at that point, I like if you have a view of the horizon in the distance behind you, I think this will be from the southwest. So you'll look sort of back this way, the sun. I'm not positive about this, but this is how I, I think it'll be. And you can see, if you have a horizon view, quickly you look and you can see that shadow, the moon shadow rising up, the edge of it in the distance, and then it comes up like a wall of darkness. And you see that, and then you turn and glance to the ground without, and that's without your glasses, glance to the ground without your glasses, and you might see alternating, rippling interference patterns of light and dark that are called shadow bands, and they're, ripple, just alternating ripples of light like Venetian um, blind. I've seen them about as wide as Venetian blinds. And then one time I saw them and they were really big, but they alternate. And that's very quick. And that's the point at which you put on your glasses and you look up. And the last, the last filament of light is breaking up because the moon has mountains and valleys and they're sparkling and appearing and disappearing. Bailey's beads, points of light. And when the last one shrinks down, that last one, you see it? That's when it's safe to take off your glasses and watch the diamond ring effect, when it just flares out. And um, that's when the shadow in, 
overtakes you and you're in totality because that just and then you can see the corona emanating out like these threads these luminescent ethereal waves of solar energy um, into space when it's really clear and you've got that view unencumbered by anything and the, one of the coolest things you see filaments red crimson scarlet neon filaments um, off the surface of the sun because it's blocked there and those are 10,000 mile high hydrogen fountains fire fountains shooting off <laughs> into the um, and into the um, space and we saw one at our last eclipse and then it had formed an arc it had shot like up and then had come back down and was like feeding itself back into the sun and it was this giant crimson loop I mean, you know, it's about this big when you look, but it's, and I asked an astronomer, how many Earths would fit in there? And he goes, about nine. And so you can see that, and you can see planets, sometimes bright stars. If you take a moment, and, and this is a good thing, this one's a long one, so you have time to look around you, and all around you is like a 360 degree sunset effect, because you're under a shadow cone, and light is bleeding in from all around you. So it's this 360 degree sort of jaundice peachy yellow color, like late uh, sunset effect. And um, so let me and just, just the corona and one mm -hmm. more thing. And oh. then as it's ending, as totality is ending, you'll see it starting to oh, yeah. lighten up along one edge. And that's when you can see the chromosphere, sometimes earlier, but the chromosphere, which is what these hydrogen fountains are. And it's like this wall on the moon of this same crimson, scarlet, neon fire. And that's what struck me the first one we saw in Chile. I didn't know what it was. I was like, what was that wall of neon, scarlet, red? And ah, uh, that was the chromosphere. So, and then after the chromosphere comes the second diamond ring. The second diamond ring. And then there's you have to another put your glasses back on. It's and that's when you have to, yeah. But most to, people but are not interested in the waning phases you, because totality well, you, is. You, one thing is, <laughs> watch the direction, like the opposite direction that the shadow came oh, yeah. from, and you can see if you've the got a view, you can see the shadow recede away, uh, heading for Rochester on this one. Totality is so spectacular that, you know, we often remind people that. There's still 98% <laughs> eclipse and nobody's looking at it anymore. Champagne good corks time. are flying and people uh, are cheering. And as a somewhat older person, I'll say that's a very nice time to take a portrait photo because that lighting is very flattering at, <laughs> right after totality. Uh, and by the way, the, the corona, the shape of the corona depends on the sunspot activity. So when there's low sunspots, it's the winged sun that the Egyptians put on the back of chairs. And when there's a lot of sunspot activity, think of it as magnets, so the corona becomes like a flower. So or, I don't remember or a what star, it, like the one we saw last year. It really had that. There were so many points of corona coming that? out. It looked like that sort of stylized star. We are, yeah, and so high, might be high, like high that, solar yeah. activity, so we should get a good So climate. in ending, in conclusion, I just, since we are in a temple, I wonder if people would like to join me in my favorite prayer. Uh, I looked it up in uh, Wikipedia, and the Shehekianu is generally when doing or experiencing something that occurs infrequently from which one derives pleasure or benefit. So it is my favorite prayer. So, and I used, they wanted me to be a rabbi, so please join me. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, shehekianu, v'kiyamanu, v'higianu, lazman hazeh. Baruch, uh, blessed are, praised are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, for granting us life, for sustaining us, and for helping us to reach this day. And tomorrow too. So, and should we take questions? If, if we're done. Are we good? Or no. Let's take a few questions. Or? Right. Yes. So, if there are any questions, let I me will... just pre preface this. 
I do not know what to tell you about your camera setting, what lens, what aperture, any of that. I have never touched a camera in any of my eclipses. My advice to you is do not try and photograph this unless you are a hobbyist who's really adept and has studied this and has a setup. Put your phone down. Do not, you're only going to get, if you took a phone photograph, fuzzy little, a black dot with a fuzzy ring around it. If you want to do something cool where you have your group and you know it's secure to put your phone, set up your phone at a distance, filming your group and watch the level of darkness overtake you and, and just the excitement hearing the people and oh wow. And, because really, don't do it. Just <laughs> surrender to the experience. Don't touch, you know, it's, it's, the only thing you should hold are binoculars. And you can't use binoculars unless you have very specific covers um, until it is complete. So anything anybody wants to ask, we'll go. OK, so I will hand out the mic for people who would like to uh, ask questions. So OK. Where exactly are you going to be tomorrow for the eclipse? <laughs> we, we have scouted out several areas and it, uh, there's a lot of variables. I actually like it here. <laughs> I mean, I love the grounds are so beautiful and, but the th there's so many variables. One being the incoming clouds, which are also supposed to be exiting efficiently, effectively before totality, before um, things get really good. Uh, the other is traffic you know, getting someplace, if it's crazy, tra getting here, we had a little scare because we were coming down Shaker Boulevard, yeah. and we were stopped for like 10 minutes, and there was blinking lights ahead, and it was, you know, sad because I walked up there, and they were tra doing a medical transport of someone and bringing them out into, and I'm like, you know, please, I ain't gonna, I've been there, done that, I don't wanna um, have any negativity about that, take your time. And so, but we got here and it cleared up. So, you, but you just never know with traffic if it's going to be, because there are people in Texas who are now crazed. They're, you know, they were, oh, this is the best place to go. Texas is going to, and now they're like, ah, and they're on the highway and they're <laughs> sleep deprived, some of them, and they're desperately trying to get to Vermont or Maine or here to Cleveland. And I don't know what, you know, and where people are going to be going, but. I suggested this as a place because it's really beautiful. Um, another place I like, we're in downtown Cleveland, is the public the square. Public square, that boomerang shaped grass area. Um, but I'm concerned about it being overrun with so many people that we have about 30 or 40 people with us. Um, will we be able to all be a you know a group together without being? Yeah. Um, They're expecting 300,000 people downtown at the lake. So. At the lake, yeah. I kind of wrote yeah, that off. <laughs> that's where we're staying downtown at the Ritz, so I don't know. I don't so, know. and there are other parks. Um, I think it's going to come down to weather. weather. And the thing that I hesitate about here is the weather will be moving west to east, and this is further east than Cleveland. So I don't know how fast it's moving, what will clear. Um, by the lake, it often seems to be clear. The answer is we don't know. We're not, we're, Next you know, question. the, Next the question. here, um, public square or somewhere nearby, I guess. How long is totality going to be? So it varies, um, you know, it, it, here it will be about three minutes in Cleveland, about three minutes and 50 seconds, 48 seconds, depending on. Yeah, about t it'll be Absolutely. around 10 seconds fewer than uh, four minute mark. It's about 427 down in the border area of Texas and Mexico, and about that in Mexico, I think 426, 27. Um, but it's a generous eclipse. Most yeah. eclipses are about two minutes, really, uh, 150 to 230, somewhere in there. So. Um, yeah, this is a nice one. The further out you get from the center line, the um, sure. less duration you get, because it's an oval shadow, and in the middle it's more um, coverage. It's longer uh, passing over you. 
An important question. What is your lifelong cumulative um, uh, experience of totality? I'm sure you've calculated this. No, the, we min haven't. the minutes? The minutes, we haven't. We, we, we haven't. really haven't. I mean, a lot of people do that, and they're like, really obsessed. There's this guy, Xavier Joubert, and he has a thing where they've all entered him in, and, and I guess I should at some point, but I don't know. I just like, like I tell people, it's not a contest, <laughs> it's a collaboration. <laughs> Tomorrow's Clint's 21st eclipse and my 20th, and that's totals. We don't count the annulars because... When we have five or six of them. Five or six of them. And a lot of partials and lunars. When should you put your glasses on and when should you take them off? Okay. I, you know, there's so, this is like, I'm amazed by this because I knew it would be a big event, but it's bigger than I ever dreamt it would be. I mean, every news channel has a box on their screen, total solar eclipse, and just coverage is, it's amazing. I'm, you know, edified. I'm, happy about it because people are into this um, so there has been some controversy people who want to get their name out in the media who are eye experts say some of them say oh there's never a time where you should really look at it without glass I'm like, you are crazy you are a spoil sport party pooper you're ignorant you don't know what you're talking about you may be an expert and, but you don't know eclipses so you can when you see that last with your glasses and you're watching the last bead and it's this last point of light, like they all disappear, but there's still one point of light, you are safe to take off your glasses and watch the diamond ring, which he said he thought the sun was exploding yeah. because it just flares, it spikes out kind of of light and then the shadow hits you. The consideration you have with that, and I wear an eye patch to keep this eye dark during that, because you're still looking at a little sunlight, so it pinholes down your pupil, on, you know, looking at that last flash, but it's worth seeing, I think. Um, and even when I wasn't, I still saw corona. So you just see a little less of the detail of corona quite so quickly if you look at the diamond ring, but it's, I think it's worth it. And you can always just say, okay, diamond ring, I'm closing this eye, I'm watching with this, and then open it. Um, but as soon as, um, it's dark. I mean, it gets plunging dark. And you, if you're looking through your glasses and the light disappears, that last bead, take it off. Take it off. And even people make a big deal about burning your eyes. To burn your eyes, you really have to hold a gaze at the partial uh, little film, the arc. Or I mean, you have to hold it steady for several seconds. Um, it's not like, oh, you know, the Ten Commandments or something. Um, it's, it's, and, and you can recover if you have a light one over time. And it's like a floater. You don't want it. But it's pretty hard unless, you know, there were talk about if you're drunk or you're high on LSD. When do you put on your glasses? Tell you put on your glasses, you're watching it, and it gets light, and you'll see the chromosphere, the red layer. And then there'll be a diamond ring when the first ray of light comes back and it blossoms out and the shadow's gone. You can watch that blossom out. And if you're really concerned, just move your head a little bit because there won't be a focal point on your eye. You know. But you should put the glasses on after the diamond ring. After that second diamond ring. Take them off. You'll see it. You'll be looking and, and people go, oh my God, diamond ring. And then you can, okay. But you won't. I mean, you'll look and you'll think, oh my God. <laughs> champagne, sparkling apple juice, whatever. You know. uh, the diamond ring is made, it's, it looks like a diamond ring because you have that point where the light's flaring out, but around the black disc, the early corona is already beginning to show. So there's this glow around, and so it looks like a band. Um, and then at that point, it looks like a diamond throwing off light. So that's why it's called the diamond ring. Thank you. Um, I had the good fortune to go down to the 2017 eclipse down in Kentucky uh, at the invite of a friend who said, hey, you want to drive seven and a half hours with me and go on down and watch the eclipse and drive on back? 
it was phenomenal. It was amazing. But something I wasn't prepared for, and I didn't hear you address, and I'm wondering if you have experience with this, is um, the natural world, the life of the animals, and how they are so affected. I was in a vineyard, and the birds went berserk, the cows went crazy, the horses went nuts. I, I wasn't prepared for that. And I, I don't know if you've had any experience with something in the natural world yourself, other than what you're seeing, or what even causes that for them? Well, it's all confusing because they have, what would you call diurnal rhythms, I guess you would call, and patterns they're used to of this amount, and it changes gradually as the daylight changes, but all of a sudden, well, I'm supposed to go into roost? What? I'm just getting out here and feeding on the seeds, or, you know, or, wait a minute, this isn't right, it's getting dark, and so I have, we have had, like, birds quiet down, maybe, yeah, maybe your crows in Mongolia, but we haven't had a lot of that kind of experience, because we haven't, yeah. Well, this, this is our mostly it would be like bird. what I, I remember is like birds in a tropical, sometimes area, quieting down, but a lot of times we have been on cruises, Boats or, and airplanes, so we miss a lot of that. Well, one yeah. thing I will say that was really clear, so obvious to me at the last eclipse and on the boat, we were docked in the harbor, um, 420 last year, and it was windy, you know, nice breeze, strong breeze, it just stopped. I mean, as soon as the eclipse was in solid progression, I don't know what percentage was covered, it just stopped. I mean, it was like, wow. <laughs> and I've seen um, from Chile, and I felt that other times, that in Chile, um, that we didn't get to get, get, that we should have gone to in 2019, but we went to the Pacific. Um, there was a photograph, and a guy was there photographing totality, and there was a lake in front of him, and it was the wind was blowing the lake, but then right before totality, the wind stopped, and it was just glass, mirror smooth, and he's got this incredible photograph of totality, and it's reflected in that still lake. He's like, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> and this will be our first eclipse in an urban center. We've never, in 20 or 21, we've never been in a city. But the nature, uh, humans are animals too, and, <laughs> and watching them is, is sort of fun. Yeah. I held our dogs at the 2017 one. I, they didn't do and much. And they didn't, they were. They didn't do much. <laughs> they were just happy to be picked up. Do you know when the next total eclipse in this area is going to be, and what is the next total eclipse you're going to travel to? The next eclipse, I don't know in Ohio exactly. Someone said 400 years. I don't know yeah. through here. But the next one in the United States, there's one in 2044, and then there's one in 2045. And I think the 2044 is more in the sort of northern mid I honestly haven't looked that yeah. closely I've seen it but we I should live read. and be well right? yeah and I do know that the I'm pretty sure the 2045 comes up sort of like this one with a different path but through a different part of the I think the eastern seaboard so the next one we'll go to is in Spain in 2026 and then we are signed up for Egypt in 2027 uh, yeah the Egypt one and I don't know, who knows what's going to happen in the world. Exactly. And, um, be able to travel there or whatever, and hostilities or uh, good fortune. But it is the one that is the sorrows of the one we saw out at sea that was the longest. Oh, yeah. That was 6, like 39. And this is decreasing, but it is still the longest one from this point on. You'll have a chance to see. And at the peak, I think it's 6 minutes and... 28 seconds or something like that. For those of you with the friends, Valley of the Kings in Australia, Australia is going to have five total eclipses in the next 10 years, I think. 12. Yeah. It's, they yeah. get it. They're, yeah, they're spoiled. <laughs> I mean, what, yeah, they get at least three Ellen, in a short. Ellen. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um, I'm Ellen, and I was with Donald and Clint and a cast of thousands. No. Uh, in Turkey, and I just wanted to share how um, calendars and life is aligned. Um, my mom died on Adar 2, 29, 
in 1984. And when we went to Turkey, I realized that her yard site was the day of the eclipse. And it was quite, quite impactful for me. And then when I was preparing to come here, her yard site is tomorrow. So it's the day of the eclipse. And I got in touch with Donald. I said, wait a minute. And that's when he told me about the Soros effect or cycle, the yeah. Soros cycle. And obviously, it's aligned in one way or another with the Hebrew calendar. So there you go. As usually, we have it all sorted out. So let's, uh, maybe let's start bringing the question to the close. So let's, let's just take one more. There was a young lady who really wanted to ask. Can't hear, hang on. Jenny. Hi, uh, Hi, I'm Jenny, sorry. This isn't a question. I just wanted to answer somebody else or something somebody else brought up. The reason why animals freak out the way that they do during the eclipse is due to uh, their circadian rhythm. Uh, so they're used to a certain length of the day, they're used to uh, their own habits, so when that is thrown off, they freak out. That's the right word. Thank I said diurnal, but it was my niece. Yep. My niece, the uh, ecologist. Uh, yep. There was someone okay. who did want to do one more question. Who <laughs> there is you. one more question? Yeah, okay. okay. Just a comment. Would you please do one of your candle lightings or <laughs> ceremonies for us? Because I am so excited about this, and I can't wait to see it. Hopefully I do. <laughs> you know, I, I just ask hard and hope for the... <laughs> um, yeah, well, I just tell you, every time I've gone with my gut, it's been a good time, and my gut did not say go to Texas. It said don't go to Texas. And Ellen and mentioned Ellen she was coming here at Passover last mm -hmm. year, and suddenly it just felt right to come to Cleveland. So here we are. Here we are. God bless us, everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Okay, right. so thank you so much. Thank you much. all for coming. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for these absolutely fascinating stories. So uh, obviously feel free to ask questions in the more informal uh, setting. There is uh, a little reception awaiting you outside and uh, enjoy your day and maybe tomorrow we'll I see yeah, something. We <laughs> might be, we'll see. The clouds, I would like to be here. Yeah.